Hi everybody and welcome to another Backstory brought to you by the Bendigo Writers Festival. We're really sad that we can't be with you in person but we are so excited that tonight we're going to be talking with Kate Forsyth and Lorena Carrington about the publication of their brand new baby Snow White, Rose Red and other tales of kind young women. And I have to say that um, Kate Forsyth and Lorena Carrington are not only two of my favourite creators, but they are also two of the kindest women that I know. Um, Kate is uh, probably Australia's leading teller of um, folk and fairy tales uh, in Australia, but she's also incredibly well known overseas for her books uh, that range from um, the ex extraordinary book um, about uh, Dorchen Wilde, um, who uh, was the wife and the source for many of the grim. Um, Folk and Fairy Tales, we'll, we'll talk about that book a, bit, a little bit later on. Um, her last book, The Blue Rose, um, for anybody that loves gardening, who loves uh, revolutionary France, it's the book for you. Lorena Car Carrington is just an extraordinary artist. What she can do with layered digital photography is extraordinary. And I'm hoping that we're going to be able to um, zoom in and show you some of the extraordinary illustrations, photographic illustrations that you've done, Lorena, for this latest book. So welcome to you both and, and thank you. You have both been guests um, at previous writers' festivals um, and it's it's always great fun getting to know you and, and seeing you both. So welcome along. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. That's wonderful. So I wanted to start, um, before we get into looking at um, Snow White and Rose Red, um, how did you two meet and and what was it that that determined that you had to be creative buddies it's such a lovely story and it is a story that, that we love to tell so i'll start and Lorena can finish so that we can share the story of our meeting so um i've always had a, a deep love for and fascination with fairy tales ever since I was a very little girl. And um, I studied them in my first degree. I've used them in my creative work in all sorts of different ways. Um, quite a few years ago now, um, I was undertaking a doctorate of creative arts in fairy tale studies. I had to write a novel, which was Bitter Greens, and a, um, a theoretical examination of a fairy tale. Um, which was a book called The Rebirth of Rapunzel, a mythic biography of the maiden in the tower. <gasps> Sarah's got it there. <laughs> so it was a massive job, as you can imagine, undertaking a doctorate. I was writing, I had children and a family. Um, and so when I, I finally was allowed to call myself Dr. Forsyth, I decided that I wanted to buy something really special um, as a reward to myself for having. Uh, you know, completed this major achieve, achievement. So I thought, well, since my doctorate was in fairy tale studies, I'm going to look for a piece of fairy tale art. And I looked and I looked and I looked. I was Googling here and going and looking at websites here and nothing spoke to me powerfully enough. I wanted it to be exquisitely beautiful, but also I wanted it to have a sense of, of the darkness and the peril that I see as being such an important part of fairy tales. Anyway, one day, a writer friend of mine called Alison Tate um, uh, tweeted it to me and said, oh, Kate, have you um, seen the art of this Victorian artist, Lorena Carrington? I think you'll really like it. And I went, oh, well, that's interesting. Now, you need to know that Alison didn't know I was looking, actively looking for fairy tale art. She just thought that I was going to like it. So I clicked through on the link that Alison had sent me and I came to Lorena's website. And at once I knew that this was the art that I wanted. It, it, had a, it, 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 it had that sense of wonder and enchantment. It had the darkness. It, it referred back to all the fairy tale art that I had loved as a child and an adolescent growing up. It was perfect. So I emailed Lorena and basically said to her, may I buy a piece of, of your work? And then Lorena emailed back. I'll pass it over to her. <laughs> and I said, well, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Let 
let me see. So we um, we uh, uh, talked about the piece of art that Kate would buy, and um, I sent Kate a print. And a week or so later, I got this beautiful email from Kate with a, um, a, a photograph of the print up on the wall. And we kept emailing back and forth and, and we became friends over email. So we talk about our garden and our children. So, um, so I've got two daughters. Kate has one daughter um, about the same age as mine. And um, we became friends first. And um, then one day Kate asked me what I was working on at the time. And I said, oh, you know, I've been working on um, an exhibition and some exhibition pieces, um, going back and finding old fairy tales where girls and women had their own agency. They, um, I know these, these stories are out there. Um, there have always been tales of brave young women and kind young women and bright young women who were having their own adventures and um, slaying their own dragons or not needing to slay the dragon after all. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, um, so I sent Kate that email and I heard back almost straight away from Kate saying, oh my goodness, so am I. <laughs> and Kate, you'd been, um, you'd been going back and finding those tales to retell. Um, and that felt like the most magical um, a, a connection, I suppose, right there. That's right. It was like the universe had brought us us together and I must admit you know so I've been wanting for a long time to retell these old fairy tales I didn't want to impose our modern feminist sensibilities on top of the existing story I wanted to discover stories that had always carried um, these themes of you know feminine agency in their heart and when I'd been I spent quite a bit of time exploring Lorena's art, I was hoping that she would say to me, you know, I basically said to her, well, I've been writing these stories, but I, I can't create art. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was hoping that Lorena would say to me, well, I've been creating art, but I can't write them. Mm -hmm. It was just uh, a wonderful kind of discovery of each other at, at the perfect time for us. Yeah. We began to, to collaborate. Um, and the months went past and we would explore different stories. Lorena would send me art and I would send her stories and together we built, um, we put together seven stories, which I thought was the perfect number, lovely fairy tale number. And then I said, well, now we have to find a publisher. And because our whole, I mean, at this point in time, Lorena and I had never met all of our all of our engagement has had been through technology, email, Twitter, Facebook, etc. And so I thought, well, why don't I just test the waters? And so I put a post up on Facebook that said, I have long wanted to publish a collection of unjustly forgotten um, fairy tales that have uh, themes of of feminine empowerment at their heart. I wonder if anyone would ever want to publish a book like that. And literally within seconds, we had a response um, from Monique Mulligan at Serenity Press going, yes, 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 we want to publish this book. And it, it, again, it just felt so right. It, it, it felt so natural and so serendipitous that, you know, I think that we were, I sent them an outline that day and we signed within a week or I think so yeah <laughs> <laughs> was, was that Vasilisa yes or was there yeah yeah so the the um the marriage of and I use that word deliberately because it's a, I think it's a very fairy tale word the marriage of Kate's research and words and Lorena's research and her artwork I, I just think it's an absolutely perfect match. It's really, um, as you say, Kate, Lorena's art style has just enough of the edginess, the darkness, the whimsy, um, but the beauty and the magic in it as well to capture what, what sometimes the stories that you tell, they're, they're difficult ones to tell. Uh, the, uh, we might, um, we might, 
spend a bit of time actually looking at this wonderful new collection now. Um, I loved all of them. I've saved one of them uh, as a reward for doing this fantastic chat. So I haven't finished, um, I haven't finished them all yet. But what I loved about them and what I love about um, Lorena's work, and, and Kate, you might like to comment about this, is Lorena, you very much, even though these stories are full of the old world um, sensibility and the darkness of the forests and, um, and the darkness of the characters, you very much use an Australian background. So we see eucalyptus leaves, we see gum nuts, we see twigs that, that are very definitely Australian. Can you both talk about that in terms of um, what they add to the story? Yeah, sure. Well, um, in part, it's, um, it's born through necessity because I work with photography. So I have to photograph the landscape that's around me, where I live. Um, but it's also quite a deliberate act as well. And often when I photograph the people um, in the illustrations, they're in silhouette but they're not necessarily in, in olden days clothes. They're, um, they're not, yeah, they're often wearing their own clothes. So by drawing in the, um, the people and the environment that's here now, I think it, it, um, it reflects that connection with the old stories and, and the new retellings as well that Kate is doing. Um, so Kate, you're, you're keeping the stories very, very true to their, their early forms, but um, you're, you're giving them a, um, what would you call it? It's not even a twist, it's... Um... Yes, um, I think you actually explained it, it beautifully, where what we're doing is, because our intention is to bring back to life stories that have been, that have been forgotten, that have been lost, um, our aim is not to make them as if they were let's say an insect preserved in amber we aren't pretending that these are stories which only existed a long time ago what's actually important about them is that they have they have continued to grow and change and adapt just like language is a living thing stories are living things and so to try and freeze frame them in some idealized form and say that's the uber form the earth form that is to deny their vitality and their, and their relevance to modern life. And so both Lorraine and I felt quite strongly that we wanted to make them living things, not butterflies pinned to a page. And to do that, we had to, um, in small and subtle ways, acknowledge the freshness of language and of image and the fact that we are drawing upon our own modern lives in order to reinvigorate these ancient stories. Mm. And I think it's it's really interesting um, the form you've used in this collection. Wonderful forward by Isabel Carmody, and another I know dear friend of yours and another great Australian writer, um, and who just adores folk and fairy tales as well. Um, and then you go on, and and I, what I find so interesting is you give a very brief um, one sentence introduction. Which it gives the title uh, and says where the, the the story was first published, and then you tell the story, and at the end there's a note from you, Kate, and one from Lorena. So Kate, you give the sort of the the background to why you've decided to include the story and the research that you've done, and Lorena, you you'll make some comment about the um, illustrative process or um, decisions you've made in the book. I want to talk a little bit about the research because for those who don't know your work, Kate, you research, you are an absolute research junkie. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you, <laughs> you're one of those writers that loves the research almost as much as you love the actual writing process, yeah. hence we need to call you Dr Forsyth. Um, but your work that you did uh, in the book The Wild Girl, can you just tell us a little bit about that? Because I think... It, it, that's a story that not, well, unless you've read your novel, not a lot of people will know about. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, the, the preoccupations and obsessions that I reveal 
in the Wild Girl are of course also revealed in the in, in the Long Lost Fairy Tale collection. So the story of Dorchen Wild or Dorchen Wild, as her name is pronounced in German, it's spelt wild and mean and means wild. Um, I stumbled across it while I was doing uh, I was researching my chapter on the Grimm Brothers in my doctorate. Um, I'd always imagined um, that the Grimm Brothers were kind of old people, old men in medieval times, riding out through the countryside, collecting stories from little old women at their spinning wheels and old men leaning on their shepherd's crook. And what I discovered was that my conception of the Grimm Brothers, and in fact everybody's conception of the Grimm Brothers is, is wrong. The Grimm Brothers were young men. They were contemporaries of um, Jane Austen. In fact, Jane Austen was older than either of them. Um, they were very, very poor and they couldn't afford a horse or they couldn't afford to go out riding around the countryside. They actually lived in a small um, medieval town in Hessen Castle and they collected their stories from, the, from their friends and their neighbours. Um, and most of whom were young women. So Dorchen Wild lived next door to the Grimm family. She was born on the same day as Lottie Grimm, the only girl in the Grimm family and the youngest. Um, and they were best friends. And she, um, she was a source for more than a quarter of all of the tales in the Grimm Brothers' first collection which was published in 1812. She was only young, she was 18 and 19 years old when she was telling her stories to Wilhelm Grimm and they fell madly and passionately in love but were uh, forbidden to marry. And in actual fact, um, they would not marry for a considerable amount of time, which did make writing the, the wild girl difficult. It was very hard to sustain sexual tension for 12 years or more. Anyway, um, I fell madly in love with this idea of this young woman meeting the love of her life in secret to tell him uh, these extraordinary stories um, that were filled with romance and beauty, but were also filled with fear and darkness and pain. And um, Coming to research, I knew straight away, as soon as I read about her, I had to write about her. I, it, it was like a bolt of lightning. But the research was absolutely, absolutely um, incredibly difficult because um, although millions of words have been written about the Grimm brothers, very little has been written about the young women who were their source. They were unacknowledged, unnamed, and were largely forgotten by literary history. Um, Dorch and Wild, um, there was only one little letter left in her own handwriting, which she wrote when she was 12, and she wrote to Lottie Grimm, and she confessed that she had a bit of a crush on, on Bill and Grimm. And that's the, the only piece of original primary source left for mm -hmm. her life. So I had, to, I had to build her life out of the stories that she told. I had to identify every story that was hers and where she was when she told it. And so and, it took a long time. Yeah, and you've, I think it's such an extraordinary work of um, feminist research uh, and, and um, social research that you've done because the Grimm brothers, they weren't the only ones who were in a way, um, uh, well, they were retelling and but putting these these stories in print because Perrault did the same thing w with the French literary salons where the, the French women were telling these stories and of course Andrew Lang did the same thing uh, in with the, the some of the British um, uh, folk and fairy tales. So it, it is a really important thing that we understand that these stories essentially are told by women in That's in their exactly right. early so films. Yeah. You know, Charles, you know, Charles Perrault said that most of the stories that he retold have been told to him by his, his nurse. Um, the film brothers, the majority, like about 89% of all their stories came from female sources. And Andrew Lang didn't actually write the fairy tale books. His wife did. Mm -hmm. She did wow. most of the research. Most, she translated many of them herself. 
and she was the one who who actually wrote most of the of the versions that were published and she's and she's never named mm. Mm. which when you think about it is Lorena when you were talking about the fact that um the heroines in these stories they don't need to go off and fight battles because they're fighting battles of their own <laughs> That's one of the biggest battles, isn't it? To have a voice of your own. The the characters that you give voice to in these stories, is there a favourite character that you have or a favourite story? Or is that um, like picking, picking favourite children? It's like picking children, <laughs> I think. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's it's always yeah like every author says I think it's it's the one that you're working on at the moment <laughs> it's the current one um, I've probably got a few a few favourites out of each book I think uh, in Vassalus of the Wise um, my favourite would have to be um, it was it was called the Stolen Bairn or the Stolen Child in this version and it's a um, it's a Scottish tale about a single mother and um, she's traveling on her own with her young child, her baby, and leaves the child on the path safely while she's collecting um, herbs and plants along the edge of a sea cliff for um, yeah, something to eat for them both. And she falls off. So this baby is left stranded on the path and is found by the Shay, who are the fairies, um, not not the kind of fairies that most people no, not Disney think. fairies. <laughs> <laughs> they're um, they're a bit tricksy, and um, but one thing that they they always um, are searching for is a human child of their own. So they take this child that they think has been abandoned anyway, and um, the mother is is rescued and and she recovers and the first thing that she does when she wakes up is ask where's where's my child where's my baby and i said well there was there was no baby where you were it must have been swept out to sea or you know it's gone and um she uses the only resources that she has um which is her own hands and and her own brain I suppose, to um to venture out and to um get her baby back from the fairies. And it's this incredible story of um, this one woman without, it's, you know, it's one of those rare tales that doesn't have um, that classic mag um, a magical trope, I suppose. You know, there's no one waving magic wands. There's no, <laughs> um, the only magic in it is, um, is her own love for her child. Um, so that's, I think that's an extraordinary story and I think is, I think will always be one of my mm. favourites. Mm. And I, I that one in Vassalisa. That, that the painting, or well, not the painting, the artwork of Lorena's that I first bought comes from that story. So she'd already been working on it for quite a while before I was, um, you know, introduced to it. And I, I had never read that story before too and I absolutely love it as well. Yeah. She's just finding it for you. She's going yeah. to show you. The oh, that's wonderful. I, I, want, I want to get you um, right. soon, Lorena, to deconstruct yes. one of your uh, amazing images um, for us so that we can all go away and um, buy our own copy and pour over it. There it is. That, that is the artwork that led oh. me that I first bought and which now hangs in the hall in my, um, just out, outside my study drawer. Um, so both Lorena and I choose the stories together. It's not that um, I choose the stories and then Lorena illustrates them. It's the story has to speak to both of us. It has to spark um, uh, artistic endeavour in both of us. And um, when we choose the stories, we quite often I'll be thinking about how much I. Uh, I want Lorena to illustrate that story and Lorena will be thinking oh I wonder what Kate's going to do with this story so we play to each other's strengths as well mm -hmm. um, it's always very hard to choose a favourite um, I think probably in the first book Basilis of the Wise and Other Tales of Brave Young Women um, I love the singing Springing Lark mm -hmm. which is a, a Dorchen field tale that she told to Wilhelm um I, oh, I, I love Katie Cracker Nuts, which is another Scottish tale 
um, which I've loved ever since I was a girl. And again, um, it's about a young woman who, who saves her sister and the prince figure. So it's, it's, you know, it's very much about a young woman who uses her own, her own wit and her own um, courage and heart to save somebody else. Mm. And, and that, those themes run very much through um, your latest one, Snow White, Rose Red. In fact, the opening story, which is Snow White, Rose Red, about the sisters who are so different in many ways but incredibly close and that the loyalty and the passion they have for each other uh, and, and wanting to do the best for each other. What was it that spoke to you in that story? Well, that was um, that is actually a favourite of my my own childhood. Um, it's it's one of the few stories where you see um, a single mother um, happily raising her own children, um, in, you know, completely independently. Um, I have an elder sister who is blonde, and so I was always dark haired, and she was always blonde. So um, we used to play at being Snow White and Rose Red. I was always happy to be Rose Red. Uh, Red because she was the wilder one, the one that was always running off barefoot and playing with the animals in the forest, while Snow White was a little bit sweeter. Sorry, I'm, Belinda. In, I'm interested, though, um, you put a... Now, I have to do a bit of a spoiler alert here, but you actually want to... You wanted to have a different... Or, or you imagined that there could be a different ending mm. uh, to the happily ever after of that story. I'm interested why you didn't make that change yourself oh um well that is a question that goes at the heart of what we're trying to do with these stories um i'm not um even though i am retaining the stories in my own words and in my own way and even though i do make changes along the way sometimes for various reasons um i'm not aiming to make the story completely new I'm not aiming to change its fundamental pattern of action. Mm. What I'm trying to do is to um, breathe through silver in C.S. Lewis's words. Mm. So allow the story to be itself, but breathing it through silver, making it as beautiful as I can, mm. um, adding an, a little bit of an extra polish to make it shine. Um, so the ending you're talking about is I always thought that red. Rose Red should win the Enchanted Bear Prince. Obviously, Rose Red had the wildest spirit, but um, Wilhelm Grimm um, had him marry Snow White, and so I respected his choice mm -hmm. <laughs> in that. <laughs> the, um, the way the bear is rescued by Rose Red is... Again, that, that trope of the, the heroine who is um, persistent, persistent. Uh, she is incredibly strong-willed, but she also has a kindness to her. So these ones, I didn't get a sense of sort of an, avo an avert uh, or aggressive feistiness in these characters. There's a, there's a very well gentle but strong strength in these characters but kindness as you say in the title um other tales of, of kind women that's really the the underlying theme throughout the book why did you decide uh, to choose kindness do you want to answer this one Lorena? um well it's i think it's it's a decision that we both um came to didn't we so um Vassilis of the Wise looks at um, bravery and uh, the Buried Moon looks at brightness, which could be taken as cleverness or brightness of spirit. Um, so we, I think we went back and forth um, for a while on, on the third book and, and we decided that, um, especially nowadays in um, the way politics and um, news is often tilted, um, that kindness was um, something that we all need to be reminded of, I think, that it's, it's such um, a powerful and important strength. Uh, a lot of people look at kindness as a weakness because, um, you know, you're not, you're not powering out there and <laughs> slaying dragons or, but, um, 
but to be kind, I think, is is one of the most important and strongest things that we can do. Mm. And we also wanted to to celebrate the fact that there are many different types of strengths as well. So, for example, in in the Buried Moon and other tales of bright young women, we have a really feisty character in Molly Wuppy. You know, she's she's the exact epitome of feistiness and she was wonderful to write but what we're trying to do in every single book is we're trying to to show different aspects of um of our theme we're showing different types of strengths different types of abilities we want to make sure that there's a really good balance between um you know darkness and light uh humor and pathos um uh, you know how the stories feel on the page as well and so, you know, sometimes a story that we both really love isn't put in the, in, in the collection because it's too similar to another one. Mm. Yeah. So the, I think one of my favourites in, in this latest collection is uh, Strawberries in the Snow. And, uh, I mean, it's such a delightful title and it makes you think, oh, how was this going to happen? Uh, which, you know, is, is the best thing about folk and fairy tales, I think, making you wonder how is that extraordinary thing going to happen in the story. We see elements uh, of Cinderella really reflected in this story in uh, the, the main protagonist who has elements of being uh, the stepsister who is doesn't have the power in the story but then of course ends up having the power and, and her power is kindness and seeing and looking after other people's needs what do you think people can take from this story so strawberries in the snow uh, in the snow is actually one of my favorites in that book as well um it's uh it's one of the most common stories across cultures so we see it you know charles perot wrote Diamonds and Toads, which I always loved when I was a child. George and Beald had a story called Three Little Men in, in the Wood. Um, other grim stories like Mother Holder. It's uh, a really common kind of theme in in fairy tales that you know kindness will eventually be rewarded, and unkindness will eventually be punished. Um, you know. What I think we hope that everyone will take away from this is a renewed understanding of the importance of compassion, mm. the importance of um, being kind just for its own sake. Um, the heroine of Strawberries in the Snow, she is not motivated by uh, a desire to, to gain something. She isn't going out there in order to out into the snow searching for violets, strawberries and apples for any other reason than that she wants to be kind. And, she's, she, and she gets what she wants because she helps people along the way. And so I think that, um, you know, we've been using the hashtag kindness is contagious mm. quite a bit with this book because I, what I have found in my own life is that being kind is actually its own reward. Yes. And that what you give out to the world is returned to you threefold. And so the more um, um, energy you put into being kind and compassion, being empathetic, doing things for other people for no other reason except that they need help. To me, if we all did that, the world would be a far better place. Mm. The, and it, it's I, I think it, it, it the timing of the birth of this book although it's very sad we can't all be in person raising a glass and mm. toasting it in person um, I, I think it is really the message of the moment although it is a lasting message as you say that kindness will open doors not in a mercenary way but in a way that is a natural fit and really brings a sense of peace. And I think what really jumped out at me in um, Strawberries in the Snow is that when uh, the the, sister, the stepsister and the mother go out into the snow to, to find the apples, their sense of crawling over other people, not stopping and helping the, the sick and the lonely along the way, really shuts doors in their faces. And it, it's such a, a simple but a deep lesson in life for us all to learn. 
a lot of people have said, well, you know, folk and fairy tales are written ages ago. They're not relevant. You both clearly think they are relevant to today. Yes, absolutely. And um, I hope that that's an invitation for me to get up on my soapbox. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, in natural fact, what, one of the things that motivated me to, and Lorena to make these books together is an absolutely passionate belief that they, um, that old tales carry old wisdoms and that um, to, to forget these old tales is to lose the wisdom of them. Um, J.R.R. Tolkien said, one should always listen to the tales of the old wives because that is where the ancient wisdom lies hidden. It's not a perfect quote, but I've got the meaning. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've all, always agreed with that. Um, you know, fairy tales are our oldest narrative form. Um, fairy tales have been told since humans develop language and so their their patterns of action their symbols their motifs their metaphors these are deeply encoded into our subconscious and so we we dream in the language of fairy tales we um we express inexpressible in the language of fairy tales um these stories will always be relevant as long as we are human because um what they do is they articulate um, these, these deep universal human fears and desires, these kind of longings um, that are quite hard to work through. Um, the, the, the aim, the purpose of fairy tales is to help us become fully integrated humans, to work through our psychological, um, this, you know, the psychodramas of, of what it is to be human. And so you take these stories away from us and we don't have the tools that we need. So, yes, fairy tales are still relevant. Mm. And I think they're probably more relevant than they have been for a long time. Mm. I, I think also, Lorena, I don't know if you want to comment on this, but one of the things I know when I um, worked at the uni that I would talk about with my students was the concept that, Fairy, folk and fairy tales in their original or as close to the original forms as we can get them, not the sort of Disney-fied saccharine versions, uh, also help people to see the dark and the shade. And if we only see characters who are good, when we come across the darkness that, we, that inhabits all of us, it, it makes us shameful or it, or it makes us fearful whereas these stories can help really um, help us to understand ourselves and a lot of people have used them in bibliotherapy um, you know to help children understand themselves Lorena have you got any comments that you want to make about that issue yeah absolutely I think that's um, I think that's one of the incredibly important things about looking back into the history of fairy tales. Um, a lot of people talk about um, original tales. Um, you know, as Kate has said many times, there's no such thing as an original tale. They've all evolved from um, stories around the world and, and through history. You know, there are versions um, of Cinderella that date back thousands of years um, through China. So these, um, stories helped us for many thousands of years to uh, become the people that we are as individuals and as um, as cultures and uh, and societies as well. So I think going back and looking at those tales um, as they were as far back as we can find them, um, yeah, is extremely important because. Each, each culture changes tales to fit its own sensibility, I think. So if you look at um, the tales that, say, Hans Christian Andersen was telling, he was, he was telling them from a very, um, a very Christian perspective and I find a very kind of um, moralistic mm. perspective as well, a bit, a bit too moralistic mm. sometimes, I find, with old Hans. Um, and then, yeah, you know, we get through to what we view as um, the Walt Disney tales, and um, they you know, those tales, the um, the versions of Sleeping Beauty and Snow White and Rapunzel, 
um, they're the only versions that most people are exposed to nowadays. And um, you know, they've been quite sanitized and um, any um, strength of female character has often just been completely erased <laughs> sort of over several generations of, of telling these tales. Um, so having that, that layered history of tales and being able to read um, many different versions, I think, is, is extremely important to see that um, sort of as, as human beings, we've always been complex and interesting and, you know, we've always been filled with light and dark. Um, you know, we've always been complicated, <laughs> I think, and um, you know, looking at the history of fairy tales is a fantastic demonstration of that. Mm -hmm. Your um, illustrations, if we can spend just a little while looking at them now. Um, I always love, and I'm, I want to turn to the story. Uh, is it the last? Which is the one that has the fabulous um, briars in it? I should have. Miss Chanter Hill. Oh, yes. Horus. Yeah. The, um, or is it tricking the witch? Maybe it maybe uh, it is tricking the witch. Tangle of them. The one, yes, it is. It's tricking the witch. And this is the illustration that I'm sorry, I'm flaring at the screen. And Lorena, can you um, talk us through this illustration? You'll have to for those of you at home, you'll have to go and get this book and on page sixty one uh, you'll you'll find this illustration. Yes. So Lorena, can you talk yeah, us through sure. it? I'll, I'll start by talking a little bit about how I make the illustrations first, if you like. Yeah. Um, so as I alluded to before, um, everything in the illustrations, so um, that hanging rose and all the leaves and thorns and twigs, they, um, they're all photographs first. So um, when I, I create an illustration, I go out um, either into the wilds or into my backyard with um, the camera and I photograph the landscape um, around me. So I'll often get down quite low and we were talking about this in, in the book launch a few nights ago. <laughs> um, I'll be out photographing um, things out the bush, which usually involves me lying in a ditch by the side of the road somewhere to, just <laughs> to photograph you know, some little mushrooms or bits of grass. I think I've, I've startled quite a few people. <laughs> coming past. In your tax deductible plastic pants. Yeah, that's right. When I last saw you, I last saw you pre COVID, we you were out hunting for plastic I was, pants. I was on my way to Ireland where I knew I'd be lying in many wet ditches but around <laughs> interesting mushroom soles. I was out buying some um, fishing pants, I think, so <laughs> to keep myself dry. It was a good look. I can tell you. Um, so I bring those photographs home and I also bring home interesting things. Um, so I'll collect leaves and twigs and, and bits of bone, um, skull, you know, little animal skulls and half eggshells. Um, and sometimes I'll have friends collect things for me as well. So um, a couple of years ago when uh, we were working on Vasilisa, I needed um, an illustration for a bridge of skulls, which I've got here. Mm -hmm. um, it's this one here. But I needed, I needed my bridge of skulls. And um, I had the skulls, <laughs> of course. I've got my shelf of skulls. Um, but I was trying to work out how to put the bridge itself together. And um, we had some friends staying at the time and they went um, out for, uh, for a walk in the bush near our house while I kept working. And they were gone for quite some time and finally came back. And um, my friend Peter had her beautiful silk scarf all wrapped up in a bundle. And she came and said, I've got a present for you. You're going to love it. I was like, mm, okay, because <laughs> I knew where they'd been. And um, she untied the knot on the table and opened out the scarf. And there was a pile of bones with a little skull perched on top. And they'd found a whole fox skeleton lying out in the bush, which is quite rare because usually when something dies out there, it gets eaten by other foxes. And 
but it was it was perfectly laid out um, as a skeleton so, and it was it was nice and dry <laughs> very clean so I um so I photographed each individual bone and made sure I photographed it to scale and I recreated the fox you can see in the bridge here here's his skull and his Oh, wow. uh, backbone and tail and his little legs. So I did have to Google how a fox goes together <laughs> once I photographed all the bones. So I think in total I had, uh, um, I think it was maybe 80 something bones that I, I had to jigsaw back together again. So that was, um, that was, that was quite fun. Um, so it's, it's really, um, it's, it's a montaging of many, 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 photographs and I do that montaging in Photoshop uh, on the computer. I thought I'd done quite well with um, that Fox illustration that had sort of in the end after I'd made the um, bridge and then layered in backgrounds and made the castle and the ground and the figure. I think it had over a hundred separate photographs in it and I thought I'd done quite well there. Um, and uh, Kate and I are working on book four at the moment. And I sent her um, an illustration last week of a Persian palace that's made up of over 200 separate photographs. <laughs> so <laughs> I've upset the precedent. Um, so yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, to get back to the illustration that you showed earlier with the roses and the thorns, um, we had a, we have a, a climbing rose in our backyard so I um I picked a few of its sort of trailing tendrils and photographed them on the light box so for all the elements I photographed them on the light box which is a nice even white light source underneath which means what I, I photograph from above then will um all come up as a, a perfect silhouette um so I did that with the rose branches and um it took much longer than you'd expect to make a random tangle of, <laughs> um, of branches. I, I thought, oh, this will be a breeze. Yeah, this one, I'll throw them together. It took me days to get everything just right to leave gaps where I needed to and, and to give that sort of woven um, kind of, and yes. And um, I, was, I was also... It, I think I was maybe reading um, Kate's book um, on the pre-Raphaelites at the oh, time. Yes. So I, um, I thought I'd sneak in a little bit of a William Morris uh, inspiration into the... I can see that. <laughs> yes. So with... Um, and so it's got Kate's son in the background. Oh, I was wondering who the silhouette was. Yeah. And um, if you look really closely at the pink rose, there's a little um, extra addition to that as well. Um, there's a little face in the side of it, which, um, which often takes people a while to see. <laughs> yes, it took um, me a while. Yeah, and, and the other thing was all the thorns. I'd, you know, I had to um, make sure it was clearly a rose bush. And it had little tiny thorns on it, but they just weren't showing up. So I ended up pasting about 40 or 50 individual thorns on all the branches. <laughs> this is why you two are such great buddies. <laughs> Your stories, really. <laughs> we don't like to make things easy for ourselves. <laughs> Oh, extraordinary. So the files on your computer must be huge. Oh, to enormous. Put yeah. All those photos in. Yeah, I've got um, I've got quite a few external hard drives um, where I keep everything on. I'm I'm fairly organised now <laughs> with my folders. So I've got folders. I've got um, you know folders that start out with people and plants and animals, and then they've all got subfolders. So plants has got you know many many other folders with then sticks and flowers and twigs and mushrooms. And then you go into those folders and they've all got some folders. <laughs> so I can always, almost always find exactly what I'm looking for when I need it. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to think about how many terabytes of images I've got, <laughs> but I'll often be um, working away on an illustration and piling in layers and trying out backgrounds. And I was like, gee, it's really starting to run a bit slow and looked <laughs> and that one individual file is 3.29 yeah, 
no gigabytes of <laughs> which um photoshop can't save as a photoshop file i have to actually save it as a special large format document <laughs> yeah. so we yeah. yes we're really um straining our dropbox account that's <laughs> that's for sure do both of you now because you you've both got so much experience in the in the fields you work do you do you process the world through writing an illustration is everything a possible source material for you i certainly do yeah um especially if i'm uh, you know working in a book on the time at the time um yeah i need to start taking my camera around with me all the time <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's, you know, I think this is true of all creative artists. When you're in, um, in the process of creating something, you become very, very, very um, hyper-focused and um, everything, it, it feels as if the entire universe is bending itself to your needs. So, um, you know, you want something, you need something, and then it, it is delivered to you in this almost magical and shared serendipitous way now i know this is magical thinking and it just feels this way but sometimes the discoveries that you make just when you need them are so eerie and so powerful it raises all the hairs up on your body and you think oh good i'm meant to be doing this i'm being rewarded because i'm doing what i'm meant to do the universe wants you to tell those stories yeah 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 i like to think i'm terribly um rational and skeptical about things and then <laughs> Yeah, that fox skeleton turning up at just the right time. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Thank you, universe. I'll, <laughs> I'll take that one. <laughs> and what about the way that, that you found a violet, not growing in the snow, but growing in the middle of the winter? You needed a violet that very day, and you walk and there's a violet growing in your winter bear garden. Come on, that is mad. <laughs> so I actually had to go back and check the date to make sure I wasn't. Um, making it up in my memory but i was working on the illustration for the front cover of this and the illustration itself um if i can find it quickly has got in the snow um yep it's just here um anyway it's got um three panels in the original um, um illustration it's got the strawberries and it's got the apples and up here it's got some violets um okay you might know which oh, yeah okay. one um and i had apples in the fruit bowl and i had strawberries in the fridge but it was that's right no. so um yeah but i it was early august and um violets aren't known for growing especially in central victoria in midwinter so what am i going to do i thought i'll i'll go i'll go for a walk in the garden and um try and get a little bit of i think there was a little bit of sunshine out that day and look around and maybe there's a flower that happens to be out that's close enough or, or similar and i walked out the back door and literally growing in a crack between our veranda and the gravel um of our backyard was this struggling tiny violet plant um with one flower on it <laughs> waiting for me uh, outside outside the back door and i you know i had to look around to go i couldn't i couldn't quite believe it <laughs> at the time so you just left okay. it there for you Pardon? you had just the universe had just yeah, left it there right. for you yeah. so that was very much you know a, okay and i'm going to give you another example when we were working on the buried moon and other tales of bright young women we were looking for stories we were searching for stories and I really, really wanted to have something that was completely unknown and that came from a completely non-Western culture. I wanted to, um, I wanted us to embrace stories from all different lands and all different cultures. And then um, a librarian at a high school in Sydney emailed me and said, Kate, we are cleaning our library and I've discovered very old, battered collection of old fairy tales. Do you want it? And I said, oh, yes, please. And she sent it to me and it ended up being a collection of um, fairy tales from the Arctic Circle, from the Samai people. Yeah. 
and in it was the most perfect story for what we were trying to do in that collection. Um, it's called A Mother's Yarn and it's basically set in the Arctic Circle and it's about a young woman who survives because of her wit and her, her trust in the wisdom of, of her mother. It's beautiful, isn't oh, it? I, mean, I think that might be one of my favourites yeah. out of that book. Mm. Yeah, and again, it's, it's, um, it's a girl or, or young woman who has uh, yeah, yeah, to rely only on, on her own wits and her own um, strength of character. And um, yeah, she begins with a piece of string and um, uses that to catch a bird. And then each step leads her further and further to being um, warm and fed and self-sufficient. That's um, stunning, an absolutely stunning story. She survives a winter in the Arctic Circle where the sun doesn't rise for six months with nothing more than a little piece of string to, to begin with. It's a wonderful story. And if that librarian had sent it to me two weeks later, or had thrown it out, we would never have discovered it. So anyone out there that's got beautiful, old, battered books of forgotten fairy tales, send them to me and I will give them new life. That's wonderful. And it, it, it's, I wanted to finish with this question. You um, are both so generous in the time you give to your fans, your, the readers that you meet and the people that contact you. Are, are there any stories that um, you can share about uh, letters people have sent to you or comments they've made about what your stories have meant to them? Yes, I, I, I'm sure this is true of Lorena as well. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the things that gives us most joy is to know that through our art, we have, um, we've reached out and we've touched other people's souls. And in many cases, we've helped them at a time that, um, that was absolutely crucial for them. Now, we didn't know that, that we were going to be doing that. It's, again, a wonderful kind of combination of serendipity. But sometimes people who've been in a very, very dark place have been given a glimmer of light through a story of mine or an illustration of Lorena's or something that we've said in an interview or something or a story that we've told that chimes so powerfully with them. And again, it gives you that eerie feeling as if maybe we're doing more than we know with our work. Um, you know, we really hope that we can help change the world for the better through art. That is what we want to do. And um, stories and, and art have an extraordinary way of kind of piercing the heart in a way that other things don't. And so even though our stories are small and our lives are small, I like to feel, I, I, it gives me enormous joy to know that somehow they're, meet, they're, they're filling a void in someone else's life. Yeah, absolutely. And that's um, yeah, the wonderful thing about, about kindness and about compassion is the, 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 the community that it builds, I think. And that's... Um, you know, when you give kindness, I think that's one of the biggest things you get back is is that wonderful um, yeah, sense of connection with other people. And you know, we um, we put our you know, like you said our, our small things into the world, but we get so much more back. I think um, I certainly don't think of myself as having fans. I uh, I feel like you do. You have so many. <laughs> you do. <laughs> So many fans. Yeah. Be modest. <laughs> but yeah, we're all part of this um, extraordinary community, and um, yeah, it it goes around. Well, your fans here in Bendigo uh, and beyond, we are so glad that you could join us today, and um, we wish your newest baby, Snow White and Rose Red, uh, all the best. And uh, we send it out into the world for you, although it's already had its launch. And we know you're such wonderful and uh, treasured friends of the Bendigo Writers Festival. We look forward to seeing you back in town one day when everything is as back to normal as it possibly can be. So thank you both very much, Kate Forsyth and Lorena Carrington, for joining us for this backstory brought to you by the Bendigo Writers Festival. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.